The Jenny Jones Show was a popular talk show broadcast for 12 years from September 1991 until the winter of 2003. One of the many media exploiting talk shows that supposedly featured real people with compelling personal stories. On an episode called Same Sex Secret Crushes, taped on March 6, 1995, a gay man named Scott Amador confessed his love for his friend Jonathan Schmidt. While on the show, Schmidt reacted with laughter, but he became disturbed by the incident later. He had a history of mental illness and alcohol and drug abuse. Three days after the show's taping, Schmidt killed Amador and was later convicted of second degree murder and received a sentence of 25 to 50 years in prison. The episode was never aired. According to the testimony at the murder trial, three days after the taping, Amador left a suggestive note at Schmidt's house. After finding the note, Schmidt withdrew money from the bank, purchased a shotgun, and then went to Amador's mobile home. There he questioned Amador about the note to which Amador just smiled. Schmidt then returned to his car, he got his gun, returned to Amador's trailer. He then shot him twice in the chest, killing him. After killing him, Schmidt left the residence, called 911, and confessed to the killing. In 1999, Amador's family then retained Jeffrey Feiger and sued the producers of The Jenny Jones Show, Telepictures, and Warner Brothers for the ambush tactics and their negligent role that led to Amador's death, saying that they should have known about Schmidt's mental illness history. In interviews, Jones said, Producers told Schmidt that his admirer could be a man, but Schmidt maintained they misled him into thinking it would be a woman. While under oath, Jenny Jones admitted that the show didn't want Schmidt to know his admirer was a man. Amador's family won the initial ruling and the show was ordered to pay them $25 million. In May of 1999, the jury found that Jenny Jones' show was irresponsible and negligent, contending that the show intentionally created an explosive situation without due concern for the possible consequences. Time Warner's defense attorney later claimed that the verdict would cause a chilling effect on the industry. The judgment was later overturned by the Michigan Court of Appeals in a two to one decision. The Michigan Supreme Court declined to hear the case. The case is now studied in law school tort classes because of the legal significance of saying the show's producers were not responsible for guest safety after they had left the studio. Today, the Insider Exclusive will examine what's it like to take on a major media company, irresponsibility and accountability in the media, rules and standards that should limit or prevent improper behavior in the media, reversing the verdict, fighting for the little guy, and why free speech will always prevail. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from the Figer Law Firm in Detroit, Michigan. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff Feiger. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Good to see you. The Jenny Jones case. The Jenny Jones show, too. Yeah. The Jenny Jones show and case. Yes. That was uh, an amazing case. It was in the news a lot. It was a euphemism for the dangers of this, uh, you know, uh, surprise uh, um, ambush television. That's what that this case has become. It's the euphemism for taking advantage of your guests at the expense of your guests, in this case, a guest's life, to make money. Yeah, that happened a number of years ago. Remind our audience a little bit about the facts of the case. Sure. Scott Amador was invited onto the show because he had indicated to one of his friends that he had a secret crush on a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Schmitz. They both lived uh, nearby here in, in Detroit. Uh, Schmitz was mentally ill and had a real uh, problem dealing with his own sexuality and the potential for violence. Amador knew nothing about this and the friend responded to what they do on these shows which was they solicit ideas and she saw that they were soliciting ideas on secret crushes. It didn't say gay secret crushes. Well she called in the show they loved the fact that Scott Amador had a secret crush on a Jonathan Schmitz, even though nobody 
checked up to see if Schmitz was mentally ill or not, and if he had a propensity for violence. And now all of these shows, as a result of my case, do these psychological profiles on everyone. They brought them both to Chicago secretly. They had Schmitz, or they had Scott Amador come on the show, tell his secret crush, Jenny Jones elicited all this stuff. Then they brought uh, Schmitz, the murderer on this show, and had him embarrassed, in effect, by Scott Amador's affection. Now, Schmitz was mentally ill. Mm -hmm. The minute he met the, left the show, he thought that the entire world was going to think that he was gay, and he really had a problem with that. And he was crazy on mm -hmm. top of it. I mean, he, this guy had locked himself in closets at times and built altars for his girlfriends. He had literally nailed himself in a closet at one time. Potential for violence existed. That show lit the fuse. Within one week, Scott Amador was dead of a shotgun wound to his chest because the minute Jonathan Schmitz left that show, he got crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier, and he identified the source of his belief that the whole world would now consider himself to be gay, consider him to be gay as Scott Amador. And he killed him. He walked up to his door pointed a gun shot, a gun, uh, shotgun right at his chest, didn't say a word, blew him away, mm. blew him away. And I said, this is wrong. This would never have happened but for what the Jenny Jones show Warner Brothers did. And it wouldn't have, and the jury agreed with me. Right. Jury awarded $25 million. Of course, when you get up to the appellate levels, the fact that juries give you money doesn't mean anything. It's where the money's coming from. If the money was coming from you and me, the appellate courts wouldn't protect our money. Right. But they do protect corporations and insurance companies. That's their role. How did the, the Amador family find you to represent them in this case? They found me the way everybody finds me now, just by reputation. I mean, everyone in America, but certainly in Michigan, knows uh, about my representation of Dr. Kevorkian and my work as a trial attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm out there. I, that's why I'm lucky in a sense. I, I get to pick and choose my cases. Now, most lawyers don't get to do that. Most yeah. lawyers have to take whatever comes in the door. I'm lucky in that sense, and uh, I chose to take this case because I thought it was a good case. When we were discussing the Kevorkian case, I asked you what was your legal strategy. You uh, mentioned your human strategy. What was your strategy in this case? This case was about just what I've told you. The story of this case was about a sh TV show for the purpose of making money. That is, having a big audience and having the audience entertained. Put people's lives in danger unknowingly and unwittingly, and whether they should be allowed to do that. Should they be allowed to do that? And the jury said, N O twenty five million dollars. Right. No, they should not be allowed to do it. So even though the appellate court overturned it, as you mentioned earlier, now TV shows. And do you know the reason? Yeah, they absolutely do psychological. And the phony reason given by the appellate courts was that they couldn't foresee the Jenny Jones show couldn't be held responsible because they couldn't have possibly imagined that if you bring a crazy person onto the show and tell him, expose him to another man's affections, that he might not do violence. And that's just absurd. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's the type of people we get on the appellate courts when violence is done to gays and lesbians every day yeah. because of their sexual orientation. For an appellate court to say that a show couldn't conceive if you ambushed somebody and put them in the situation that I described, that the potential for violence doesn't exist, is, is, is equally offensive and equally obscene, in my opinion, as the uh, actions of the Jenny Jones show. Has there, you know, the, the show comes to mind, the Jerry Springer show. How do they cover themselves, protect themselves, when you see a lot of crazies come on their show? Well, I actually had that case, too. That case was called the Jerry Springer murder case, and uh, uh, Ralph Panitz in Florida was accused uh, and convicted of second-degree murder. 
One of the issues in that case was whether the Jerry Springer show had in some way incited. It didn't really. It wasn't a parallel case, although yeah. the media tried to make that an issue. Um, there have been no cases, and the, really the reason why there have been no cases is immediately as a result of the Jenny Jones show case. All of these people who are brought on these type of shows are given psychological profiles. And there really is no more of these ambush situations. Yeah. They've really stopped that. The ambushes have basically, by and large, stopped. We're fortunate today to have the trial judge here with us today. He's a very retired judge, Gene Schnells. Yes. Uh, judge Schnell is a very learned man. I don't know what he can say about our case other than having observed it being observed tried. It from the he's, bench. Remember, he's not an advocate, he's a judge. Yeah, so we're going to bring him on right now. Okay. Welcome to the show, Judge. Steve, my pleasure. You had the distinct privilege of being a judge in probably one of the most watched cases in America with Jeff uh, representing the family of Scott Amador. Um, from a judge's point of view, I'm going to ask you two questions. From a judge's point of view, how did you view the trial? And secondly, from a personal point of view, how did you view the case? Well, first of all, I don't necessarily construe it as a privilege. I have the duty. Okay. Uh, but it was a very, very fond duty of mine. It was a superb trial. Uh, Jeffrey always does a superb job. I had him in a, so many cases over the years in which he's excelled and done tremendous work for his clients, I mean, very frankly. Um, but for, uh, there were just a couple of perspectives. You know, the trial's the trial, and uh, I think the thing that intrigued me the most was, uh, if you want a war story in connection with the thing, is about two weeks into the trial, we arrived, the attorneys met together, and we arrived at a settlement in connection with this matter. We agreed on an amount. Well, the problem we had is Time Warner owned Court TV, Time Warner owned Jenny Jones. So the attorney for Time Warner said, after we agreed on an amount for the settlement, I have to call home office and see if I can get final approval. Uh, she came back in and says, we can never settle the case. I said, why? And they said, because the ratings are higher than anything since O.J. Simpson. <laughs> it's all about ratings. So we, yes, and so Jeffrey was a little bit upset that he was having to perform. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. They didn't want to settle because they wanted higher ratings. That's than exactly right. right. They, they didn't were care what money. happened with Warner Brothers oh, because they've got Court TV broadcasting it yes. live, gavel to gavel. Oh, my and God. They, they're making so much money on that, and they were really this advertising the case every day. Exactly. And we had reached a settlement. Yeah, and we had a gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, of course, from morning to night. You know, that was the entire So let me thing. ask a judge, <laughs> what do you say to the opposing attorney? What do you say to them? I said, let's get to court and we'll get to work. <laughs> I guess at this point in time, we have no You don't choice. say, this is not right. This is not ethical. Uh, it's not a good reason not settling. It, it's not a question of ethics at that particular point. They didn't make the decision. The company made the decision hmm. not to settle. So it isn't. It isn't that issue. And they were good attorneys, too, uh, although one defense attorney uh, tried to out Jeffrey Jeffrey, and that was a huge mistake. There's no question about What'd that. What'd they do? Well, he tried to imitate uh, Jeff Style. You can't. You have the one and only. And I'm very serious about <laughs> this. Uh, in my 33 years as a judge, 52 years as an attorney, uh, there are two outstanding trial attorneys, Jeffrey and another attorney who uh, happens to be located in Oakland County and named Albert Hatchett mesmerizing in a jury. Just a really a great guy. He's an African-American. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And that's really, Judge Schnell tells a, a very, very, this is a worthwhile lesson to anybody who's listening who wants to go into law. You can only be yourself. You cannot be somebody else. Nobody, I can't be Jerry Spence. Jerry Spence, nor you, nor anybody else can be me. Ever, ever, ever. The secret of great trial advocacy is to find out who you are and be yourself, and the jury will connect with you. Do you agree? Oh, of course. If you're not natural, it, it comes across. And that's what came across in connection with yeah. that. Because, frankly, he was a nice man. I respect him, but he just looked foolish. Uh, and uh, the unfortunate thing is they had a very good attorney from Texas that they had hired, and he was good. And they shoveled him off because I think the other attorney must have said, well, I can, I can do fighting. It's an ego thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, 
there's three things that motivate in life, you know. There's material wants, sex, and ego. Ego is the one that uh, so, motivates a lot of lawyers. So Freud was right. Then. I don't think Jeffrey works for money. <laughs> he just works because he enjoys it. You know, that's what it was. Well, how did you feel? You know, you're off the bench now. You're retired. At the end of the trial, when the jury came back and they gave it, you know, well, they gave his client twenty-five million. Not the amount of money, but how did you feel? Well, no, about I'm going to tell you more than that. When I finished the jury instruction connection with this. You know, it isn't just the trial, it's the preparation for the trial, and that's what distinguishes a poor attorney from a good attorney from an excellent attorney. And Jeffrey is an excellent attorney, and he makes sure he has people surrounding him who know what they're doing, and he had a jury expert. And the jury, now, I can only suggest this, the second day I was a judge after my second jury trial, I gave up predicting what juries are going to do because only God <laughs> knows, and I'm really serious about that. And I could tell you stories about him and Vordier that are very fascinating, but uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. For one, at one point, we had a trial. This is a medical malpractice case, and they bring in a panel of uh, jurors. And they, uh, Jeff got up to do the Vordier, the French for direct questioning. It's all it means. It's a fancy term. And he asked a question. He says, how many of you know me? And about two-thirds of the audience raised their hand. And the others probably knew him, but just didn't. Then he says, how many of you don't like me? Well, 75% raised their hand. And he says, before I'm done, they will love me. You, know, you, you to said them. that to the jury? Well, he said that right to, no, to the whole panel. <laughs> then when he went into the voir dire, some of the guys who said they didn't like him said, you raised your hand, you didn't like me. You know, what do you think now? He said, well, you're pretty good. I think I'll listen to you. you know. <laughs> and he got an excellent verdict. That yeah. was our guy who died of decubitus ulcers, as I recall. Right. You know, after they left him nine mo nine hours on a bedpan. But that's I try to I try to make jury. I like like my friend Jerry Spence says. I try to pick juries, like I pick my friends. Mm -hmm. Now and it, but in this particular case, I just finished the instructions in Jenny Jones, and the expert came up to me and he said. Uh, uh, how long you think they'll be out and how much you think they'll bring in. I said, I have the slightest idea. It could be anything. I have the slightest idea. I refuse to guess. He says, well, I will tell you. They'll be out four hours and it'll be $25 million. Who told you this? His, his jury expert. Okay. He hires good people. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, good luck. Well, he was way off base. It was four hours and 10 minutes. And it was twenty-five million six hundred some thousand. As I put it, so it shows you he didn't know what he was doing. But it was yeah. an interesting. One point. of the big issues in this whole case was, and you brought it up, was can a media company just arbitrarily and almost maliciously not even care about someone else's feelings? What were your personal feelings? You know, you're off the bench now. What were your personal feelings when this case well, was going on? One of the issues that they kept raising and raised it on appeal ultimately was the concept of First Amendment. Yeah. You know, they had a right, freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Well, we go back to, I think it was Taft that said, uh, and I could be wrong, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Yeah. And in essence, they started a ball rolling that yes. ultimately resulted in uh, the death of an individual. Yes. And they should be responsible. And the law says that. Yeah. Uh, the, the law of tort. An age-old case that all attorneys know and you can talk about, and don't ask me the name because I never remember the Paul's name of the graph. case. Thank you. Uh, it What's is the case? It's called the Paul's Graph case. Yes, there's a train going across with, in the day of wood and coal burning. A spark comes out of the train, catches a field on fire. The field burns up to a barn, burns down a barn. There's yeah. an itinerant sleeping in that barn. He is killed. Who is responsible? the train or not. And they say, yes, you set in motion a set of events which ultimately resulted in the death of this yeah. individual. And that's what occurred in this case. And this annoyed me more than anything, to be very frank, is this concept yeah. of arguing freedom of speech. I think it was a dumb argument, and I think it's a dumb argument today, because you don't have the right to say inflammatory remarks that induce an individual to ultimately take another's life. Where's now, on appeal, happens? it was overturned. It was overturned for precisely the reason that Judge Schnells had ruled the exact opposite. Their argument, and I don't, none of the courts bought the, the idea that you had an absolute right to say anything you want. But what they did say, and, I, 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 and it, it, it not only makes me angry, but I believe that it was disingenuous. They said that the Warner Brothers couldn't foresee 
what would happen if you bring two people mm -hmm. who are unawares on the show and light a fire under a crazy man who, who within one week shoots the object of his craziness. In other words, he believed that Scott Amador had embarrassed him and exposed him to ridicule throughout the world. Mm -hmm. I believe that's obvious. Now, then I get into the issue of whether decisions are made because the law was the way Judge Schnell's ruled or the law was the way the Court of Appeals ruled or whether something else is going on and it's really about the money. The money. <laughs> Well, I have some I have some very strong opinions in connection with that because one they, we had a, we had a major disagreement in relation to instructions. He, the, each side presented their instructions, and sure. I, Jeffrey wanted me to rule 100 percent for him. The Time Warner wanted me to rule 100 percent for them. Right. So I, I went to it, case law. It's called the Restatement of Torts. This is the the Horn Book. Okay, you follow it. I took the instructions directly out of the horn book and said, these are the instructions, which are exactly the Falstaff case, mm -hmm. and outlined it for them. Well, one of our brilliant jurists, uh, who will be nameless for these purposes, said we don't follow that in the state of Michigan, which is totally so ludicrous that it upset me dramatically. Yeah. And there was just, frankly, it was a political situation. Right. It was a frustration with an attitude that uh, hopefully is changing in our courts. There was not... Uh, not an agreement. There, there was too much business about, frankly, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, we should be getting large verdicts. Our big companies and corporations are being hurt. Malpractice is a shiny example. They put limitations in connection with sure. that. Uh, we could go on and on forever. Politics. But, uh, um, I want to thank you very much, Judge, for being on the program and contributing your insight because that's, it's rare that we have that. In front of Judge Schnell's before. I'm very pleased to introduce Jeff's co-counsel on the Jenny Jones case, as well as his partner, Ben Johnson. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. What was your role in the case? As an associate working with Jeffrey, my role was pretty much to do the day-to-day -day handling of the file and getting it ready for trial, which yes. we knew from the outset it was going to be a trial and a highly publicized trial. So it was a lot of long hours and a lot of, a lot of research. And how do you go about doing that? You know, there's a lot of discovery that you have to do, and you have to make sure that he's very well prepared in trial. Well, you don't have to make sure Jeff is prepared. Jeff is always prepared, and mm -hmm. he does that on his own. But what we did is uh, I had a, uh, a paralegal, Tanya Page, and, and we were working a lot of long hours together. And there was criminal transcript uh, testimony from, obviously, the criminal trial sure. that preceded us. It was over 3,000 pages. And so our biggest role at the time, it really was twofold. One was to go through each and every one of those pages so we knew all the witnesses uh, in the criminal case. And we did this thing called a, a summary or a digest. So we knew exactly what the testimony was. And then the other thing was to identify uh, experts. And the experts that we identified were the ones that Jeff and I called at the time of trial that really uh, made the case for us, in my opinion. What were these experts? Who were they? There were three people who actually had, in one way or another, called the Jenny Jones show before uh, the episode with Jonathan and Schmidt and uh, Scott Amador and warned them, you can't do this. You can't literally do this to people and ambush them on television. Yeah. And one of the big things and, and, and defenses, if you will, and this is what the people didn't understand, was that they want to say, and this is what the appellate court ultimately wrongly, of course, in, in our opinion, decided, that there was no warning and you couldn't predict. It wasn't, it was not only predictable, it was certain. And these witnesses came in and Jeff did a great job of asking these questions and every one of them said, I told them six months or a year before this happened, this was going to happen, it was only a matter of time. So the employees of the Jenny Jones Show had actually sought out an opinion from these experts to find out if something well, like this could happen. One of them, they sought out. The yeah. other two actually called the show to tell them, I've just seen one of your ambush episodes, yeah. and, and you can't do this to people. These are like social workers, and there was a, a gentleman oh, like, who actually, it was an after. How did you find these people? Well, that's a great question. Uh, research, hard work, Jeff had obviously done a great job of, of doing his end and, and getting this issue out in the public. Yeah and had been looking for people, and this is, this is what we do every day in all of our cases. I think I, if I'm, he stimulates a few of my memory synapses, and I get older, they're fewer and far, <laughs> farther between, but I think even one of these people actually contacted us and told us about it. 
um, that they had warned the show, and it turned out that it, they indeed had warned the show, and the show hadn't let us know about it. Right, right. isn't that gun. absolutely true? And, and, but what's so important? This is why in Judge Schnell's ruling, mm -hmm. when he ruled in our favor on the motions, and that's what should have been upheld by the appellate courts, is this was predictable? This in other law, foreseeable. foreseeable. It not only was foreseeable; it was actually explained to these people that this is going to happen. Someone is going to get hurt when you embarrass them and ambush like the. Uh, like this on television. Mm -hmm. Look, it. if you take a gun and you put a bullet in it and you spin the chamber and put it to your head and pull the trigger, okay, yeah. at some point you're going to get the bullet, okay? And that's exactly what happened here. They lit a fuse and that fuse went directly to the murder. And Steve, one of the things that Jeff did a great job of at the time of trial in his closing argument, everyone has heard, and it's a, it's a legal axiom, it's something we learn very early in law school, you can't shout fire mm -hmm. in, a, in a theater, in a crowded theater. Why? Because you know everybody's going to want to get out the door at the same time and literally someone will get trampled on. And that's exactly what happened here. They knew what they were doing. They intentionally created it. And not only that, but they lied to Jonathan Schmidt to get him on the show to make him think that he was coming to see a woman. Right. And then when they say, well, we didn't know, well, you can't claim ignorance. Of course, you won't know how many people will die as a result of sure. you shouting fire, but you know somebody could get hurt. They said, oh, well, we didn't know. Well, you knew. You just didn't know when it was going to happen. You knew. You just didn't know when. Will it happen now? I think when you we were talking earlier, you you were originally a defense attorney. Yes, sir. Right. I switched so sides. When you came, the dark side. <laughs> we the dark side. When just you as saw I found the light. My soul. When you saw the light, right? Well, it's it's really true. I mean, you you work for the insurance yeah. companies, or you work for the regular ordinary people. Now, I frankly, I don't think the insurance companies need a lot of help. You know, talented people should work for the little guy. Yeah. The insurance companies have stacked the deck against Americans from A to Z yeah. and more. When you saw the light in this case, when you saw that you had really changed the industry, that must have made you feel good. It was phenomenal. I mean, the, the I can't even begin to estimate the type of hours that Jeff and I and Tanya and, and many of yeah. our staff uh, worked on this case and literally for nothing. And not only for nothing, but we lost money, obviously, because we spent money to yeah. Kate. But it was so much bigger than that. And that's one of the great things, Steve, about our firm is we take on cases where and it certainly, obviously, we would prefer to, to make money. But on certain cases, it's bigger than money. And that's exactly what we did in that case. And I'm very proud to have been there with Jeff doing that. I think, and let me second it, it's not just bigger. It's more important than money. You guys did a great job. You did Continue a great to job. do a great job. And I want to thank you for being on the Thanks, program. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at www.insiderexclusive.tv.